Okay, it's seven o'clock and this is the Deerfield Conservation Committee meeting for August 24, uh, 27th, 2020. And present are Louis Mission. Ben Bell, Mayor of PC. Tim Hilchey. Uh, Pete Law. And Ben. And Ben Byrne. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I'm just check and see who's who's on here. I know we have. I guess we could do. Uh, we could do the uh, frontier, which track, which is an RDA for the replacement of the existing track. So. I'm not sure if Darius or or uh, is it Chad? No, not Chad. Uh, let's see. Let's see. I think I, I, Michael is on for uh, Berkshire Design, our architect. Is he on or? I think. So. I don't see him. So he's not on yet. I mean, I can oh, try to, okay. it's, I don't know how it works and what kind of questions you're gonna ask. You just did a site visit, so. Yeah, just to go over the project a little bit, usually what, so people know what, what's happening in, and uh, if you wanted to do it, I, I'm i not sure. I'll go yet. unless you can ask, you know, unless you're gonna ask, uh, you know, specifics of, uh, you know, engineering Plus, specifics of what they're going to do but yeah, I can yeah, some, somebody order. somebody might that's the thing you, but you do ex expect them to be on yes okay then uh let's uh well, so we got quite a quite a collection of people here i'm trying to see okay maybe we'll do the uh rda for, let's see, for the lot on North Main Street. Uh, I guess it's uh, map 151, lot one, I believe. And that's uh, Dan Nietzsche. Are, are you there, Dan? Yeah, I'm here. I'm just about to start another meeting too. <laughs> oh. um, Do you can wanna... we be bumped to... Can you move someone in front of us quickly? Uh, okay, let's see. <laughs> yeah, I can. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to read. Huh? You're doing great. <laughs> I'm just trying to find. Uh, let's see. Where's our uh, notice of intent for? Uh, Let's see who we got. We got Lion Whitney. No, I okay. Looks like we're, oh, there he is. <laughs> Lions, are you, uh, Whitney, Whitten, are you ready? Oh, he Wait, was. Is this back to the frontier track, Louis, then? Is that what Lions is? That's, oh, Lions. Yeah, I'm going back to uh, the notice of intent. Okay. If lines is there. Yes, I'm here now. Thank you. Oh, okay. All right, then uh, this is for notice of intent for, uh, let's see, 144 North Main Street, and it's the farm. 
and they removed some uh, fuel tanks and they happened to find one leaking. So they need to uh, excavate some uh, contaminated soil. And uh, we did do a site visit there on 825, Bill and Tim and myself were there. So we did uh, look over the site. And uh, if you could explain, Lion, just some of the, uh, what's happening out there. Um, in about a month ago, we removed three underground storage tanks, a pump um, from the yard next to the barn, paved yard next to the barn. One of the tanks had visible holes in it upon its roll. Um, the other two did not. pump and the tanks all date from probably the 1930s, maybe the 1940s. They're, they were very old. Um, regardless, there was a release of gasoline to soil um, as a result of one of the tanks. Um, and, and so at that point, um, we started could you speak up a little louder, Lyons? Sure. At that point, we started an ass you. assessment of soil in the vicinity of the tanks and determined that it um, went downhill toward what to be a brook, um, across the paved yard and across uh, a grass area. Uh, and we did a, a number of test pits and determined that there's an area of soil um, at depth that is uh, needs to be excavated and removed to remediate the gasoline and soil situation. Um, and <clears throat> at that point, we realized there was a brook out there. And so we realized we couldn't continue with that work and we needed to file a notice of intent, um, which we've done. So the plan is to uh, excavate the soil that needs to come out and then replace that soil with a clean fill and then uh, replace the current paved driveway with a um, gravel surface on top, compacted gra gravel surface that can be driven on by tractors and our machinery. Um, and then replace the lawn with loam and seed so it becomes a lawn again. So when we're all done, the grade will be the same as it is today. There won't be any more or less um, land present. There'll be no change in flood storage capacity for that brook. And the contaminated soil that's at depth will be gone. Um, that's the plan. And currently it's, um, you can think of it as the area around the tanks uh, has contamination surface down to about six or seven feet. And then once you get away from the immediate area around where the tanks used to be, the contamination's from four to six or seven feet below grade. So there's some clean material on the top that we would take off and then dig the contaminated material and then we'll put clean material back on and then the, the loam that's currently there we can reuse as part of the fill. Hmm. Does that make sense? Okay, and uh, I know DEP had a few comments and I can you just touch base on a couple there that, you know, some were just changes on the plan for the dimensions and... Right. Um, I presented two site plans with a notice of intent. The colored one showed 
showed the location of all of our assessment samples and showed the extent of contamination with some, um, some detail. Um, and at the time that that plan was put together, I did not know where the bordering vegetated wetland line was. So we drew a 1500 foot line from the center of the brook as best I could determine where the center of the brook was on the plan. And that indicated that the entire project was in the riverfront area, which is what I was trying to determine at the time. Um, and, and DEP did that I had drawn such a plan um, starting from the center of the brook, which is fine. Um, but we also presented a notice of intent site plan that had wetland flags placed in the field by a um, professional wetland scientist, and those have been picked up by a surveyor and placed on the NOI site plan by the surveyor, and that showed the actual buffer zone and riverfront areas. Um, so, uh, Mr. Stinson was being particular, which is his prerogative. Um, the two different plans serve two different purposes in my mind. Um, that's neither here nor there. It's the entire project is in the buffer zone, um, or almost all of it. Certainly all of it's in the riverfront area. Yeah. And the NOI site plan indicates that none of the proposed excavation is within the vegetated wetland. It's all outside of that. Oh, okay. Uh... That was his yeah. Major, his other comment was that I checked the box on the form that said buffer zone only that I shouldn't have checked, but my apologies. The next page indicates it's buffer zone and river front area. Okay, yeah, we, we did the site visit and it is definitely something that has to be done. And, and uh, you know, I know a couple of uh, the members weren't there. I don't know if anybody, uh, any of the members have any questions for Lyons? Louie, this is Tim Hilchey. Just a quick question. Um, do you feel like um, Mr. Lyons has addressed all of uh, Mark Stinson's comments and questions? I've read through what he said and I just want to get your, your more experienced about this than I am. Yes, I, I talked to Mark and uh, he uh, he was, I think, uh, okay with the uh, response and he does agree that it is something that has to be done <laughs> and uh, we're not going to be getting hopefully into the, into the stream bank or anything. I so. so I, I, you know, I think my, uh, only concern would be, and he did mention it, that about some additional plantings in the area, which I feel that if they do take out that tree or shrubs, just to put a few uh, few uh, bushes in to, re you know, if it has to come out, that's that's the only thing I can say. Um, the goal is, is to keep the cedar tree clump of cedar trees intact uh, so that they survive in a healthy state. And I think we'll be able to do that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> hey, hey, Louis, this is Pete Law. I wasn't able to make the site walk, so just maybe a couple of questions that you're already going through. Um, but with that last thing, with if they had to take the, hopefully you don't have to take the trees out, but do we make it a, a conditional uh, part of the approval that additional planning will be done if ne if necessary i think we can put it in under the conditions if the board agrees that put in a you know you know three or four shrubs if that tree has to come out because it is a 
it is a large expense for what they're doing and uh yeah and it is grass area so i i, I just feel that okay. you know that if the tree does come out then we should just put put some plantings in that little I, area and, and, and were you okay with all with the um any of the containment process the engineering process to keep any of the construction issues going from the buffer zone into the to the riverfront zone to the brook zone uh, those were adequate i i didn't have a chance to review that Louis is Bill Mayor of PC. You're, you're, you're muted. muted. <laughs> yeah, Peter, uh, that, that, the digging and everything else will be overseen by uh, another section of DEP. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so, Louis is Bill Mayor of PC. Yes, um, Bill. Uh, I just would like to, I think that, you know, we, we spent a good amount of time. On the 25th um, at the farm. Um, I'd like to make a motion to uh, accept the notice of intent with um, uh, an order of condition, two order of conditions. Number one, that that we are notified when work commences. Um, and number two, uh, that um, uh, um, I guess suitable shrubbery or vegetation is planted if the clump of cedar trees um, cannot survive. Okay. I'll uh, second that, Tim Hilchey. Okay. Uh, before we vote, I, 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 I do have to uh, ask anybody in the audience if they have any questions here for, for Lions or the board. If not, we'll, we'll, we can do the uh, motion there. Is, is anybody out there uh, have any questions for? I, um, my name is Poppy Kelly and it is uh, my property and my project. And I just wanted to clarify the uh, length of time that we will have to complete this project. I believe it is the, uh, is, is the three years. I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I didn't look it up in, uh, I know an RDA is three years, and and I assume that the notice of intent is three years. But if it's less, you can still file for an extension. That's my uh, understanding. I don't know. Is uh, any of the experts out there? Uh, what was the question, Louis? How long does the notice of intent? Um, it's good for conditions. It's good for three years, and every two years and eleven months, you can ask for an extension for up to three years. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dan. You're welcome. Okay, uh, if that's all there is on that one. Should, uh, do I need to, it's Bill Mayer, PC again, do I need to make the motion a second time or? Sure, we'll uh, go through it. That way it'll be official okay. here. All right. Um, so um, Bill Mayer, PC is making a motion to, to not in, in, in motion, a motion uh, to accept the uh, uh, NOI uh, with an order of conditions um, Number one, uh, that the Deerfield Conservation Commission is notified once the project commences. And number two, uh, if the um, uh, bunch of cedar trees cannot survive that um, appropriate um, uh, shrubbery um, uh, is planted in its place. And then this is Tim Hilchey, I'll second the motion. All those in favor, Louis Mission, aye. Ben Byrne, aye. Pete Law, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Bill Mayer, PC, aye. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kelly's in Lions. I think we're all set. Great, thank you very much. Appreciate Good your night. time. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Okay, I see that Dan Nietzsche's here. And, yep. And let's see. 
This is for that North Main Street lot one on map 151 for the uh, town of Deerfield. Okay. Could you just go over what what's uh, it's a RDA, so we did go yep. out. Let me let's see. We did do that on the uh, how do we do that? We did that on the twenty fifth. Yeah. Twenty fifth, yeah. And Bill was there, Tim and myself. So uh, we did the site visit and this is for uh, wetland uh, boundaries, the acceptance of. So if you could uh, explain what's going on, Dan or? Mr. Chairman? Sure. Tim Hilchey, yep. quick question. Can we ask that um, he be allowed to share his screen so he can show us the maps for the public? Um, I don't have that available to show you. <laughs> you don't? Is, is it possible for me to share the screen for him? Oh, sure. That's great. Um, is that okay, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. If you know how to do that. <laughs> Let me try it. We'll see. Yeah, if not, Tim, I'll try it. So if you can't get it. Are people seeing anything? Yep. Yeah, I yes. think you're successful, Tim. That's the that's the farm right there. Yep. So project oh, locations go. in the center here. Are you seeing what are you seeing, Louie? Yeah, I, I'm I'm seeing that outline of the uh topographic. Okay. And I'm gonna go up now to the actual enlarged drawing and now he can take over talking. All right, thanks very much, Tim. So this is Dan Nitsche, GZA. We um, looked at this property for wetland resources um, under the state and federal law. We found uh, several wetlands on the property, primarily associated with drainage systems uh, that were put in place for the agricultural use of the property. They're long linear drainage systems. Um, the one in the center, of that image that you see there, that's a bordering vegetated wetland because it borders uh, basically a ditch or a stream along the railroad tracks to the west. To the southern part of the property is a, is a partially forested wetland. That's the larger green area that you see to the far left of the image. And then that has a drainage system or, or ditch system, if you wanna call it that, that sort of parallels the southern property line with water discharging from the land off property and eventually goes across uh, uh, the street off, uh, underneath North Main Street and goes over to Bloody Brook. To the north of the site is a small, somewhat small, isolated vegetated wetland, which does not have the size, or I should say, it doesn't have the water storage capacity to equal an isolated land subject to flooding, which is a Wetlands Protection Act wetland. So it's too small for that. So it can only qualify as an isolated vegetated wetland under the Army Corps criteria. So under our state law, under our, within DEP, there's a Wetlands Protection Act and there's also something called a 401 Water Quality Certification. Under the 401 Water Quality Certification, any wetland with, on the property needs to be identified, whether it's a state wetland or a federal wetland, it's supposed to be on that map. So that northern wetland is not state regulated, nor regulated by the, by the Conservation Commission, obviously, since you're, you implement the state law. And it also has no buffer zone around it. The other green line that you're seeing around the other wetlands, that's the 100 foot buffer zone, which is a, a, you know, an additional regulated area outside of the wetland itself. So we've identified on the property, all the wetland resource areas. We had the walk recently. I think everyone you know, was able to get a good feel for the property and looking at these different wetlands. Um, and I think they basically speak for themselves when we were out there. And we, just for, uh, just for clarification purposes, we did look at the distance from Bloody Brook onto this property and it's more than 200 feet. So this property does not have riverfront area that's associated with the perennial stream, which is Bloody Brook. And that's it. 
Okay, thank you, Dan. Uh, anybody out there in the audience have any questions for Dan or? And just for just for clarification, this Pete Law, um, the green shaded area in the southwest corner represents what? The green shaded on the, the lower left there? Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's just a, a wider wetland system. That's a that's part of a bordering vegetated wetland that extends onto the adjacent property. And because it's hydraulically connected to the railroad tracks and hydraulically connected to Bloody Brook, it's a regulated wetland resource referred to as a bordering vegetated wetland because it's bordering on a stream. Because of the Bloody Brook connection. Because of the blood, well, because of the ditch system that's on the property that runs along the southern side, that's classified as an intermittent stream. So okay. there's the con there's the bordering. It's it. To be a bordering vegetated wetland, obviously they use the word bordering. It has to touch some place. It has to touch a water body or an intermittent stream, which is essentially considered a water body under the, under the regulations, even though it doesn't have water in it all the time, but that's considered a water body. So it has to border on that. So that ditch makes those vegetated wetlands BVWs. Okay, thank you. Is anybody else on the board got any questions? No. Or any comments? Louis Tamilchi, um, while we were visiting the site, um, there was, I, and I don't know, I, I'm asking a question whether it's appropriate that we even concern ourselves with this, but there was discussion about moving certain certain wetlands and recreating them elsewhere. Um, is that something that we need to concern ourselves with tonight or? Uh, no, and I have, I know what you're talking about. And uh, that'll be under the notice of intent. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that'll yeah. be described then, yep. Right, because I do have uh, some questions on that. I'll, you know, if it goes through. Yeah. But uh, right now it's just, we're just walked out there looked over the site and myself i believe that the markings and the flagging and everything seem reasonable or where they should be i don't know can't see much change if someone came out and did it different so i'm i'm, I'm happy with what's there i know that if anything's going to be done out there there's going to be a notice of intent and then that will probably require a uh, peer review of that, of course. So I think, you know, what we're saying is we're just accepting the land is there, there's wet spots, and there's a buffer zone. And, you know, that, yeah. that's, my, that's my feeling. Yep, that, that's what I thought. I just wanted to clarify. <clears throat> yeah. So I, I guess, uh, you know, I, on the uh, determination and uh, what I propose is a uh, positive number 2A and that's the boundary delineation of the fallen resource area described on the reference plans are confirmed as accurate. Therefore, the resource area boundaries confirmed in this determination are binding as to all decisions rendered pursuant to the wetland protection and its regulations. Such boundaries for as long as this determination is valid. And I'll second, Bill Mayor, PC, I'll second that motion. All in favor? Aye, Bill Mayor, PC. Louis Mission, aye. Ben Byrne, aye. Yeah, Pete Law, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. 
Okay, I think that would be the correct one, right, Dan? Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you, commission members. Well, thank you and good night. Good night now, thanks. Okay, let's get back to Frontier. Is, uh, yep, I, uh, Michael is here from, oh, there he is. Okay, uh, then, uh, okay, this is for, we'll get back to this, this is an RDA for uh, the Frontier Regional uh, Track uh, Restoration, let's put it. At, sure. And, yep. And uh, this is, uh, this is just an RDA for, uh, for this work because there is uh, some wetland and there we go. So this is the uh, 113 North Main? Yes, the Frontier Regional. Okay, thank you. So I guess we have, uh, who is it, Michael? Yes, I'll be um, summarizing, you know, the proposed work here. Yeah, if you could uh, do that. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm Michael Liu with the Berkshire Design Group. Um, I'll be uh, working on the plans to develop this um, into, um, you know, working bid set to go out for bidding purposes and construction ultimately. Um, you guys had a site walk with Carlos Nieto from our office, but he is out today and tomorrow. So I'm, I'm covering this hearing. But um, uh, basically, if you look at the plan that's on the screen now, um, the orientation is north would be to the right. Oh, there's a north arrow up there on the uh, plan. So on the bottom of the page and out of the screen would be where the school is located. And then at the upper part of this plan would be where the railroad tracks are located. Um, we are- This is about, you know, the property across the street from us. We, we are basically seeking a um, negative determination that the work Pose work will not have any adverse impact on happy uh, with this site. Um, we did not have wetlands just... formally um, delineated in the field, um, but basically that there are existing um, drainage ditches that run east to west, to the south and to the north of the track. Um, our proposed work is is to be. Uh, within the existing fencing that surrounds the track complex. Uh, right. Therefore, wow. you know, none, none of the work is gonna be in, um, infringing on any wetlands. And although we within um, uh, 20 to 30 feet of wetland ditches to the south and north, um, the work itself can be well contained. You know it's basically this? the track surface itself drains inward. Um. And um, my house is Michael, Michael, may, may I just make one um, effectively controlling sediment that might want to escape? Them. Right over here is a railroad so, track on the other side of the where's the Can Michael? I ask? Um, there's a person who's talking over Michael and she needs to mute her phone um, because I, I'm having trouble hearing him speak. I put, yep, sorry about that. No, it's not you, it's, it's a woman who's talking about her house. I don't know what her name is, Lino or. Oh, I don't even see that. Where's that? If you'd like me to repeat anything, I'd be happy to. <laughs> if no, you... I think I so, caught what you were saying. Maybe yeah. someone else didn't, but I just wanted the woman to be aware that she's talking over you. Um, all right, let me, I'll just really briefly summarize what the proposal is. So in, in what you see on the screen in the shaded areas are the, um, is the proposed um, improvements or restoration of the track representing the surfacing areas. So if you'll notice along the bottom side or the east side there, if you know the site, there are two runway areas, long jump and triple and pole vault uh, runways. Those are proposed to be removed and reconstructed on the inside of the track. Um, those areas that are currently on the outside of the track would be, the runway areas would be um, ripped up and basically loamed and seeded and returned to a green space or green area. Um, uh, and then, in the um, upper, or I'm going to call it the bottom right corner, 
the shot put would be reconstructed there, yep, on the outside of the track, but still within the fencing, which you can kind of see um, winds its way around the whole complex. Um, there was a question, Carlos alerted me that somebody had a question about how much more impervious area there would be. I have that figure, it's um, 70, about 7,100 square feet of additional impervious area created. And that's primarily due to the um, enlarging of the high jump area over on the left-hand side that currently doesn't comply with the um, National Federation and um, you know, standards. Um, for distance to the run uh, to the landing pit area and then the area over to the right where you see the pole vault and triple jump area um, it would be filled in so that you know we don't have um, isolated runways with a little bit of grass in between them um, so that basically accounts for some of the increased impervious area uh, due to the project. And then also I wanted to just point out uh, at the bottom of the screen, when you come into the complex at the bottom left, there's a gate and a paved, uh, paved drive walk that leads up to the track. Um, we are proposing to put in a, another five foot sidewalk section on the outside of the track fence, which would provide uh, ADA access when, when you get into the complex um, to walk over to the grandstand the home side grandstand bleacher system. You know, currently there's not really any um, ADA access throughout this complex. So we're, we're gonna, we, we'd like to do that to at least, you know, provide some means of um, accessibility to get over to that area. Um, but that's basically it. The, the rest of the, the, um, the football field uh, that's in the center of the track, uh, hopefully will remain untouched or undisturbed. And um, certainly we're not, Obviously, as I mentioned before, we're not proposing to do any work uh, on the outside of the fence that surrounds the complex. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Sure. Um, comments or questions? Anybody <clears throat> out there in the audience? Louis, Bill Mayor, PC. I don't know if you're, are you asking just for public comment at this well, point? I, I was, and then I was going to ask, you know, the board if they had questions at all. Okay. I would just like to make a comment that um, on our site visit on the 25th, um, I I felt as though we, we received a, a comprehensive and thorough uh, explanation. Um, uh, so um, I you. Thank you, Michael, for um, uh, you know uh, giving it to us again. But I, I do, I do think that we uh, uh, we did receive a clear um, uh, understanding that the work uh, to be completed is going to be um, uh, entirely, except for the five foot work walkway for the ADA compliance and. Um, facilitating the large trucks to come in that the actual work will can will happen within an area that's already um right uh, yeah. uh, okay. has has drainage has um it's, it's been developed yeah yes anybody uh else just just one clarification uh, this is pete uh louis i <laughs> I'm technically uh, can't get back to the the RDA to read the document, but what are, what will be what's the intent to what are we voting on here? That the buffer that is too close to the buffer area on the north side, or what? what no, we're just given the document. It would be just given the approval. It'd be a negative, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah, the, the yeah. RDA doesn't have that, you know, those check boxes or whatever, um, the, the application form, but the actual determination has, I, I can't remember what it is, if it's in the first section, um, a negative determination. With no okay, so it's no negative that you're not, not in the, the area of concern. Yeah. No. So so negative, positive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so basically there is a buffer, it, it's, it's regulated the area. And of course, we know what's out there. We did the site visit, and Bill, Tim, and myself. And 
as the plans show, they do have erosion control all the way around. Okay. And basically is like he says, the railroads over there, they got, you know, the ditch, which can be a wetland and we have some drainage ditches. And so the area is subject to the protection act, but, uh, what they're doing is contained in, inside the, uh, the whole ball field area mm -hmm. there. So, you know, I, I make a motion to, uh, to approve. I, and I believe now this is two and three are a negative two or three. They're pretty much the same thing. One says buffer and the other just relates to the, the whole, the whole area there that, uh, will not, you know, it's under protection, but it won't require a uh, notice of intent. So I think well, what I, I would do is. Are the determinations, I'm sorry, is that one point uh, C and D? There, there's two knocked off. Of, um, no, it's a negative number two. The work described in the request is within an area subject to the protection under the act, but will not remove fill, dredge, or alter the area. Therefore, said work does not require a filing of the notice of intent. Okay, thank you. Just trying to find that document here. All right. so I, I believe, uh, you know, it's two or two or three, and they're almost similar. Just mm -hmm. one just kind of refers to the buffer zone, and I think two kind of covers everything. So I would, I would make a motion to. Uh, sign off a negative number two. Mayor of PC, I'll second that motion. Uh, all in favor? Louis Mission, aye. Ben Byrne, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Pila, aye. Bill Mayor of PC, aye. Okay, I think uh, that takes care of that one. Thank, Thank you, you Michael. Thank you very much. And Darius. Thank right. you. We'll, we'll talk. We'll Thank be you. talking, Darius. See ya. You'll be all set. All right. Have a good night. You too. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Who's here? Okay. So I guess the uh, last, we have an RDA for the area for determination on whether there's wetlands or not at the corner of, uh, or corner of Mill Village and routes five and 10, map 132. 29 and 132.30. So we have, uh, I see Mary and the Pinto and it's Chad Brubaker here. So if one of you or both could start explaining what, what was out there and what you were looking for. Maybe anyway, I could tee it up. Log in just before we start. Could we get this to a screen share? So um, as we have all these documents, uh, we can see them. Do you see it? Uh, yeah. Up now, Tim. Thank you. You're going to have to show me how to do that, Tim. <laughs> when you uh, share, the bottom it just shows screen everything on the bottom here. It says screen share, but if Mary can do it, I can turn it over to her. Uh, no, you better do it. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> This is Ch Chad Brubaker from Lascotti. Um, we have a few other folks with us. We have Austin Turner from uh, Bowler Engineering, who I think has all the documents teed up to share um, his screen. Uh, we also have Mark Donahue, um, who we're going to let kind of uh, kick things off and kind of introduce Marianne and uh, go from there. So thank you. And I'm sorry, and Mark Donahue is with who? I'm, uh, if I might, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mark Donahue, I'm with Fletcher Tilton. I'm a, a attorney in Worcester and I represent um, South Deerfield DG series. 
Um, let you. me just try to tee this up for the commission since I see that there are a number of people online. Um, this uh, request for determination of applicability as to the existence of wetland resource areas is the, at least the second time that this commission has addressed this property as it has previously issued a negative determination of applicability that expired uh, on a regulatory basis. Um, this, the, the project that this is related to uh, has drawn uh, a fair amount of interest in the community. Uh, we have had a number of hearings before the planning board and we are currently before the zoning board of appeals. And as the commission knows, and uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll monitor, um, tonight uh, the, the real hearing is really one based on science uh, and applicability of the rules and regulations. And Marianne DePinto of Three Oaks Environmental, uh, who worked for a long time in the wetland uh, division of the Department of Environmental Protection, uh, will be presenting uh, those technical facts uh, to the commission on our behalf. And uh, I expect that there are other people who will also be addressing the, the technical, um, but I see it as really that and uh, anecdotal information regarding puddling or flooding or streams is really um, to some extent not helpful to the commission uh, as it really is a much more technical kind of scientific issue to be presented. And so with your permission, uh, what I'd like to do is have Ms. DePinto review with you uh, her findings of, of the site uh, in some detail so that uh, all of the um, people who are online in this fashion can understand uh, precisely what the issue is uh, being presented to the commission. Thank you. Uh, I, when I first went out to the site, I went out with, uh, after having reviewed other uh, studies that had been done on the property. And so I was looking for some specific things when I went out there. I was looking to make sure that that there were resource areas that were either subject to the Wetlands Protection Act or not, or no, or no resource areas at all. Um, there was some evidence in the reports that there were wetland plants and some wetland soils. Um, so I headed out to the site looking for those things. Um, I looked at old aerial photographs, um, looked at the property over time, um, and so on, and, and I took time to look at both the property itself, the farm fields, as well as the uh, highway right of way um, to see if there was in fact an, a bordering vegetated wetland on the property. Um, in 10.04, 310 CMR 10.04 of the regulations, definition of a stream is that it's a clearly defined channel, which is what I was looking for. And definition of bordering means touching directly on another resource area or a water body. And so I was, that's what I was looking for as well. Um, I observed wetland vegetation in the corner of the farm field. And when we were out there yesterday, I also observed uh, the same wetland vegetation, including some uh, uh, purple loosestrife that's come up since then. I went beyond the corner of the property where the wetland vegetation existed and took a look along the Route 5 and 10 uh, drainage ditch, essentially. Water comes off of Routes 5 and 10 and ends up in a grass swale. Uh, I started at the, the southern end of that swale and came up with both upland plants and upland soils in the right of way. I moved further down to the, there's a culvert pipe under an existing driveway. I found upland soils and, excuse me, upland vegetation. The third test pit in that swale revealed wet soils, hydric soils. I then went, and that's an area where it seems to puddle a bit um, based on my observations. Uh, I went further down that swale and the land begins to rise, the vegetation becomes upland and the soils were upland as well. Um, then I went out into the field. I also dug a test pit in the field where the uh, wetland vegetation was and the soils were hydric. And I moved further upslope where the vegetation became upland vegetation 
condition, and the soil was still showing some wetness to it. There were oxidized rhizospheres, and um, which are uh, red blotches that follow the uh, roots. Uh, very common in farm fields to have those rhizospheres uh, in the upper surface of the farm field because of either grazing animals, which is one common occurrence that causes those, or compaction by farm equipment. Um, the soils on the site, I also looked that up prior to uh, going out to the site, are SCIO, S-C-I-O. It's a silt loam, which is a really great farm soil. Um, the reason it's so good is that when water enters that soil, it stays for a while. The plants are able to take it up. It does not pass through the soil very quickly. And the reason for that is the silt in the uh, loam fills the little pore spaces between the sand grains and makes, it a little bit take, makes the water take a little bit longer to pass through. And, and that makes it a very, very good farm soil. For, gr for growing plants. Um, it also compacts and because of that you'll find places where wetland vegetation will come up in an upland area where there are ruts caused by the tractors and so on. So we did find pockets of wetland vegetation here and there um, but the soils were upland soils. Um, in the corner of that farm field um, it, it ends with a little bit of like a swale, a little bit of a ditch, but that ends. Uh, I, I, dug, uh, I dug some holes in that and there's a hard pan just about 17 inches down. Now the, the just soil description, um, the NRCS soil description for that soil says the hard pan is located somewhere like at 80 inches, but for whatever, however this field was treated in the past, this hard pan was closer to the surface in that swale. I, I could not dig beyond 17, 18 inches. Um, and it was that hard. So I'm looking at something that might even be a perched water table in that corner of the field. Um, in order for that wetland vegetation and soils to be considered a bordering vegetative wetland, it would have to border on a water body, a stream, a defined channel. I could not find a defined channel. I can tell that water, water runs downhill <laughs> and there is a catch basin on the adjacent property where there's some contention that it borders on that drain, on that catch basin. If it were to be defined as bordering on that catch basin, it would have to be a clearly defined stream channel that carried the water to that catch basin. Water from the street runs down the swale and enters that catch basin. Water from that parking lot goes down into that catch basin. Um, excess water in the farm field may eventually overflow and make its way eventually under storm flows to that catch basin. But there's no clearly defined channel that would cause this to be regulated under state law as a bordering vegetative wetland. Um, an earlier discussion uh, for a different project came up regarding uh, water quality certification 401 and 404 and whether or not it's subject to Army Corps. The regulations for the Clean Water Act changed as of June 22nd this year. I attended a workshop last week virtually um, that was given by the Swamp School regarding the changes in the law. And this area would clearly not be subject to 404 regulation under the new definitions of that. And if something is not subject to the Clean Water Act, Section 404 of the Army Corps, it cannot be regulated under Massachusetts 401 water quality certification. I've had experience with this in the past where uh, we tried to regulate something under with a water quality certificate and the Army Corps said, no, it's not jurisdictional. We could not regulate it. Um, let's see. 
I, ha I have submitted a report that, that describes the vegetation that I found present, the, as well as the upland vegetation. Um, I examined, uh, looked for stream channels and so on. There is wetland vegetation out there. The, the abutting landowner's property dips towards the farm fields and there's a line of vegetation there. There's no stream channel that this borders on. And uh, because of that, it's not subject to the Wetlands Protection Act under state law. I don't know if you have any questions or uh, if uh, anybody else wants to add something to that. I, 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 this is Tim Hilchey. I understood that you were going to do some screen sharing. I haven't seen any. Yeah, Austin. Uh, I can. Austin just walked out of the room. I know. There he is. Did you want to put up some some of the aerials or uh, Austin? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I'm not sure what you have there, but you could show some of the photographs. The uh, the report I submitted. There you go. Yep. So, no, Marianne, you wanted to talk or give a brief introduction on the aerial. I could um, I could bring up your report as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the area that we're talking about is beyond this very large uh, right of way that belongs to uh, the state of Massachusetts associated with the highway. Um, and you can see the farm field is beyond that. There are pockets of wetland vegetation in here, uh, but none of it's connected to a stream channel. Uh, the catch basin is over here. Uh, there's a, the area, I don't know if I, you guys can see my arrow or not. Yeah, but if you want to describe to me where you're going, I can point you in the right direction. Okay. The, uh, between the uh, lawns of the homeowners and the farm field, uh, we found a line of wetland vegetation. It went up to about where the, tr the big tree is with the shade <laughs> sticking over into the, uh, uh, sort of going northward, yes, that tree. So there was wetland vegetation from there down and that and it encompassed part of the uh, the lower corner of the farm field. So I'm gonna move the arrow down to, in, yeah, there. Um, as I followed the, the uh, wetland vegetation out, it became uh, predominantly uh, Asian bittersweet, uh, Virginia creeper upland vegetation uh, that that caused a, a break in the wetland, and then out to the uh, the end of the swale, there's a lawn, and that area I dug I dug uh, a test pit right at the edge where the uh, the state right away ends at the lawn, and that came up as an as an upland soil. I can go through the 10 YR 3, 2, 4, and 4, 3. The, uh, the first B layer was 10 YR 4, 3. And it wasn't until I got down past 17 inches. There we go. That's, that's the swale um, on the property that did not show any evidence of movement of water as if it were a stream. It just water sits there. Um, the leaf. There were no drift lines, no sediment lines, no movement of leaf material. I, and again, I didn't see that out there uh, yesterday when I was out in the field. Those are the different tidbits. This area was where I found the hydric soils, and it was a, a low area that where water ponds. Marianne, just, just for clarification and for the commission's reference, is the road that's in the upper left corner of this image, is that route five? Okay. Yes. And, and this, the, is, this, is, this is proximate to the roadway, correct? Yes. Yep. And water comes off the roadway and it ends up in this uh, swale, grass swale. There's a, a driveway that comes across the right of way, and there's a culvert beneath that driveway. And uh, this, yeah, this is the area that was, as you can see, it was, it's a little bit wetter. And then 
it rises up and it became upland vegetation. Uh, Queen Anne's lace, uh, uh, plantain, lots of plantain, um, clover, and uh, dandelion. Okay. <laughs> uh. May I ask a question? Is it? Um, yes. Hi, Marianne. It's Bill Mirror, PC. Um, uh, so um, I have a question. It, something you said just kind of I, I did not realize. Um, um, you mentioned, that, and I'm hoping I'm saying this correctly, I'm going to paraphrase, um, that there were some areas of wetland, and while we were looking at the map, um, uh, some areas of wetland along the trees. Um, yes. And vegetation, yeah. um, what was it, please? Wetland vegetation was there. Okay, so wetland vegetation is there. Um, but I'm not sure now how, but, but you were also prior to that explaining that for, a, for, for a property to be a border, like a B, BV, um, uh, W, um, it needs to have, you know, something wetlands actually right next to it or touching it. It seems as though you're actually saying that now that no, this all. area, cause it is touching it, correct? It's all part of the same isolated wetland. It's uh, <laughs> isolated as well. Part of the isolated. Okay. All right. Yes. So I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing. Can I make a request, please, that Fino um, is muted, uh, that you mute your um, your mic unless you're unless you're talking? Thank you. I had a hard time hearing Marianne's response. This is all part of the same isolated wetland. It's not bordering a stream. So a wetland to be bordering, it has to border continuously wetland. And eventually, okay. it's all, if it's all, all of that's isolated wetland. That, that little strip that runs up between the two yards would be part of the isolated wetland. Okay, isolated. Okay. Yes, because it does not border on a defined channel. A defined stream channel. Okay. Boy, that's uh, um, uh, um, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Hey, Bill. I don't want to interrupt you. This is Pete Law, and I, I just had a similar question, Marianne. Um, so, how many isolated? Um, I'm sorry. There's some background here. How many isolated wetlands are there in this parcel, and does that have an effect that there's multiple isolated wetlands um, that can be cumulative in effect? Uh, on that parcel, that's it. That's the only one. Um, this is Ken Hilchey. The right of way is not part of that parcel. There are isolated pockets in the right of way, but there's no alteration proposed of those. This is Tim Hilchey. I wondered if you could have Austin Turner run his cursor over the wetlands that lie between the condo land and then draw his cursor. Yesterday you mentioned that there was like a 50 by 50 foot area in the northeast corner that has uh, um, fern, etc. And, and sedge. And um, so could you have him run his cursor over there and correct him if he doesn't get it right? All right, Austin. Yep. Yeah, it's it, that's the highest point of it, but it runs down in the screen. Run it down and go left a little from there, left across the field. It's really field grasses. It's a wet meadow type vegetation. Yeah, across there, right to the edge of the right of way, because then it goes up from there. That, that's about it. That area, yes. And you said that that was what about fifty by fifty? I, I, While we were standing there, I just stood at the edge of the predominantly uh, wetland vegetation of more than fifty percent wetland vegetation. Turn around, and it's all Queen Anne's lace, scattered with a, an occasional purple loosestrife, but it was dominated by upland vegetation beyond that. 
Oh, Mary, I'm going to move there yet. If you went north of that on the border to what you're saying, the lawn versus the, the field, and I have a question for you about the definition of, of farm field, uh, if that affects your um, determination here, because I really haven't seen that used as a farm field. Um, but we did see some more wetlands type vegetation up that that borderline between the lawn and the in the field there in the parcel uh, was that just not significant enough uh, enough of vegetation to meet the criteria of an isolated uh, wetland because it was, you know interspersed in that whole third of that um, parcel was a, a fair amount of that just your professional opinion yeah it, it was a, a narrow strip uh, that that be that was between the two properties, really narrow strip of vegetation, and it broadened out as you know, really became part of that corner of of the uh, field. So, is that a, a separate isolated? No, well, it, it was part of it. So that so if we put the cursor back on, it would take on um, that that V in the bottom, and then kind of move all the way up by that big tree, and maybe beyond. Yeah, it's very narrow up to the tree, and then it broadens right about there, right where the cursor is. Yep. So it, it is a larger area than maybe people are, are getting an understanding on with, with the way the cursor is moving. Hmm. Yeah, maybe 75 by 50 then, another 25, yeah. Maybe 3,000 square feet. And the and as you call this a farm field, does that make any difference in your evaluation? Uh, I mean, I think they they cut it once or twice a year. Uh, I don't think there's any haying or any activity coming off of there from the years I've been here. But yeah. does that make any difference in the evaluation of how it's determined? We're right next door is the lawn, and and then you had the um, the right of way, which was more hardwood vegetation for uh, a number of years. Uh, no, what I saw was, well, you know, what existed is it, based on soil type. Even though it's a nice farming soil, I, I don't know the long-term land use. It may have been all farmland there and used as a farm a hundred years, years ago. Yeah, I, and I won't monopolize this. I'll have some questions later, but I think there's some other presentations, Louis, that uh, we want to get through. So I won't. I, I will save my other questions. I have a question, Marianne. Okay. You, this is Louis Mission. You were talking about the uh, state right away, and there's uh, isolated wetlands. You're saying, and uh, okay, yeah. On each side of the driveway, is that it, or uh, the existing driveway? Yeah, some of them are on the left side of the driveway, but not in the swale there. That was predominantly upland vegetation along that swale. But there were, I could see pockets of sedges that were in there, but surrounded by upland. I mean, we're talking 10 feet by 10 feet, you know, small, small pockets of wetland vegetation. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It is just either small little areas or, but, uh, I'm not sure now, this is going back, you were saying that that isn't going to be touched, those areas? Is that it? or They're not owned by the applicant. It's not part of the parcels that we're discussing. It's just lots 29 and 30. Okay, so what happens if there's work done in the... Uh, right away does that does that mean it has to come before the board that separate area Do you... uh, we're not talking about work right now it's we're really just talking about is this a wetland resource area subject to state law or not um if work is ever proposed in the right away it would have somebody should do a request for determination uh potentially okay so it is just those that lot those two lots it's mm -hmm. not not in the state right away at all. That's my understanding, yes. Can somebody put a cursor then so everybody understands exactly what the where the lot boundaries are? Mm -hmm. So we have a lot. 
So just as a as a generalization, this this line here is a, is the approximate right away boundary. Yeah. So everything uh, uh, west of that to the northern and the southern boundaries. Yeah, and obviously north north is generally to the right of the sheet, but everything right. below the line I just I just drew is the state right away. <clears throat> Hmm. Okay. And I, with one other thing that I did do was I took a walk down a, a walking trail behind the uh, fossil shop and uh, looked to see if maybe there was a stream channel there because it was a path. Um, there was no evidence that what, what appears is that if there was water coming off the back of the lots, it would head in the direction of the uh, right away and field. Uh, but there was no stream channel discharging water off of this site. Um, I saw evidence that water had uh, flown over, you know, that there was some sand deposits in amongst the plants, but it was nothing nothing to say that there was a stream channel discharging from the site through there and it ended as well no, it appears that the water is directed towards the farm field along that path so then is it, is it your opinion that most of the water comes through that one swale that's just south of the rock and fossil building goes into the catch basin, goes northerly pattern and into the Bloody Brook. Yeah, you know, it's like water makes its way eventually when, unless it's in an isolated situation and it just sinks in the ground, water evaporates. Water is just will work its way eventually to a water body, you know, down to a stream or whatever. But there has to be an obvious connection from the wetland to a stream channel to the water body. But if we make an educated assumption, it's coming through that swale into the catch basin, being a conduit to Bloody Brook. So that is the connection. Is that the correct I, assumption? I, I can't make that assumption without. Saying. Yeah. Okay. No, that's understood. I'm just yeah. extrapolating a bit, but I'm just trying to be. Um, pragmatic about it as well. The basin on the side of the road get, does take water off the road and uh, around that building. It does get to the catch basin. It's a low point. So that's where water would flow to. So this is Tim Hiltry. I just want to follow up on what uh, Pete Law was discussing. Um, in this image, there seems to be sort of a dark blackish line that comes from the lawn area and it goes directly towards the catch basin. Mm -hmm. um, what is that? I don't know. I know somebody spilled away. <laughs> hey, um, I'm not sure. Shadow? I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, hi, it's Bill Mirror PC. I'm not sure I'm seeing um, the uh, dark. Um, can someone use a mouse and is it, show me? Are we referring the, to this line right yes, here? The yes. Of the no, you had it right the first time. So if yes. you put your cursor back there. Yeah. And the catch basin, show the catch basin. Right. I, I am right. Right. This is what we're referring to here? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there's some pavement. I think that was that indent uh, coming in that lawn uh, that we saw yesterday. So it's a you know, slight indent where you can see the water flow coming to the to the catch basin, and, and that's a good indicator where it ends up on the on the pavement. Yeah, there's some pavement in that area, broken pavement. It's what I vaguely remember. But there is a little rut in that area where you can see where the water flow comes across there. So I, I again, that's my. Yeah, has so caught only assumption now, so yeah, yeah. I agree. Okay, uh, it was out there in May and I observed no standing water in any of it. 
Um, and it's just a bit really beginning, things were just beginning to come up at that point, green. Marianne, uh, this is Tim Hilchie again. Um, can you tell us how long the, um, the severe drought conditions have existed? Did they start in May? When did they start? Yeah, they, they, I think they backed it up to, uh, to May, the end of May, but um, for determination purposes in terms of uh, riverfront area determinations, yeah. Oh, anybody else have a question? Anybody out in the audience have a question? Yes. Uh, may, may I speak? Yes. Could you okay. say your name? My name is uh, Debbie Shriver. I live up on Pocumtuck Drive. I'm a volunteer with Deerfield for Responsible Development. And we've been working with the abutters and other residents around our concerns uh, about the 9,300 square foot retail store proposed by the applicant. And we're here uh, to ask that you consider the findings and the recommendations of a report by Kate Bednaz of Freshwater Wetlands Services of August 23rd of this year. And specifically her recommendation that a third party conduct a full wetlands delineation of the site, the adjacent state right of way and abutting properties. Uh, we also ask that the Conservation Commission select a professional wetland scientist and registered soil scientist to conduct the delineation at the applicant's expense. To put this a um, little bit more in context, in 2018, we noted a lot of standing water in the Route 510 right-of-way adjacent to the site, as well as the abutting condo property. And as a result, Deerfield for Responsible Development engaged the services of Kate Bednaz, who is a uh, professional wetland scientist and registered soil scientist, to evaluate locations in the right-of-way and the condo lands. She dug test pits and made other observations which are contained in her report of December 2018, which you all have received. Now, in light of the RDA submitted by Lascotti Development and the report, prepared by Three Oaks Environmental, which reviewed Ms. Bednaz's work uh, for Deerfield, uh, Deerfield for Responsible Development, then engaged again, Ms. Bednaz in uh, July to revisit the site and determine if the wetlands, especially those in the state right of way, are hydrologically connected to a resource area. As she reports, her evidence demonstrates that these wetlands are connected to the Bloody Brook drainage and are jurisdictional and hence the need for a full delineation. So we'd be grateful if you would allow Ms. Bednaz to speak and um, explain her findings and then answer questions you may have for her. Okay. Uh, any comments from the board first? Um, this is well, Tim Hilchie. I just want to ask, um, I think that's a great idea, but I wanted to make sure that the applicant, were they finished with their presentation? And if, if not, um, let's move along to, to Kate if the rest of the board members agree. Through you, through you Mr. Chairman, unless there's questions from the board, uh, that's the end of the uh, applicant's presentation at the present time, but obviously we'd like an opportunity after Ms. Bednaus has an opportunity to speak. Okay. And uh, Louis, Bill Mayor of PC, just um, uh, one question in regards to that, because, you know, uh, so we have an RDA uh, uh, to review whether the area is subject to the Wetland Protection Act, but the RDA does not, in, in the filing of the idea, RDA does not uh, uh, note any description of work to be completed. Um, so um, uh, that part is is not, uh, in in the RDA that I reviewed is not is not on there. So, um, could I ask? Could I let Kate respond to that? Would, would that be all right, Bill? Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. It, it, I'm sorry. Did, did I see a different a different RDA? Um, well, um, is is it asked just whether it asks about work? I I had so many I was looking at here. Yeah, I mean it does. It it. It asks um, uh, whether any work uh, will be completed on the area, and that is left blank. Um, right. 
So the, yeah, the, 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 if, uh, the RDA is strict for whether or not something is a jurisdictional wetland period. There's no work proposed. Okay. Okay, that's what I that's what I thought. I thought it was just, you know, whether there is wetland jurisdiction, you know, for us or not. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, well, well, as such, Louis, uh, this is Pete. Um, I would love to have the opportunity to, to come back to the, the applicants for different questions, but um, I would support um, hearing from I'm going to miss the name, uh, Kate, if we are uh, able to do that. Yeah, that that's fine, fine with me. If Kate is there. There. Hi, everybody. Uh, nice to see you all in Brady Bunch style. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Marianne, um, for going through your, your review out there. And um, it was nice to see that a lot of your work and my work uh, coincided in terms of what we were finding, um, but I did find some differences. Um, so the first thing I wanted to just bring up is something of more of an administrative item. And when I look at uh, item C in the RDA uh, section one, that's the project description and the project location is, is put down there. So um, the project location does reference the two lots, 29 and 30, um, from map 132. But when the area description is put in, uh, it's put in as a farm field at the corner of Mill Village Road and the state Route 5 right away. So um, the work that Marianne did was also in the right of way. Some of her presentation is from the right of way. Uh, this here is stating that the right of way was part of this review, um, but when I'm looking at the notice of an, the agenda for tonight and um, what we've been discussing so far, it sounds like it's only for those two lots. However, we are reviewing this work in the state right of way, and the state right of way is listed as the area description. So um, to me, that's a little bit confusing. Um, I just wanted to bring that up. Um, Moving forward from that, um, to try to concise things, because there's quite a bit of information that I've submitted between the 2018 report and now. You know, I think really everything, um, as Mary Ann was saying, really it, 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 the point of, of jurisdiction, since there is no bylaw for isolated wetlands in Deerfield, is that it has to be subject to the state law. And with that being said, we need to find some connectivity. So um, we've been working really hard to figure out where the water goes that is in this wetland. So, you know, the water does obviously infiltrate into the ground. Uh, I think we all agree that there are wetlands out there. Um, we can kind of fine tune that location if necessary. Um, but the real um, thing to establish is the connectivity. So um, knowing that we have wetland soils, we have wetland vegetation, we have uh, signs of hydrology that are both on adjacent sites and what appear to be on the uh, subject property, which is what I referenced in my report as map 132, lots 29 and 30. Um, you know, when all that water collects there, where does it go when it overtops these, these lower portions <clears throat> that are, have the standing water that have these hydric conditions? And um, the time that, you know, this RDA is being submitted is during a level two severe drought. And that started at the beginning of May. So um, in my report, those are attachments that show you the mapping and the dates when we're in a severe drought. So um, there is a little bit of, of um, a disadvantage to going out of this time because there isn't the opportunity to see the site as it normally functions. So um, there is a video, and I think that this video really shows the connectivity as well as the photographs that are in my report show the connectivity between the wetland and then that catch basin. Um, in that catch basin, we worked with Jay Ely from uh, MassDOT to try to figure out where it went, and it discharges directly to the culvert that goes underneath Route 5 further north, um, which conveys Bloody Brook under Route 5. 
and the culvert actually discharges in the middle, or sorry, the stormwater pipe actually discharges in the middle of the culvert, which is not typical, which is why we had such a hard time finding it. And I give a lot of um, props to uh, the residents as they really got in there uh, and looked around during every event. And the reason we were able to see this is because there was no water in Bloody Brook, which is some of the uh, photographs demonstrate this. So um, now to get the water to that point, because a culvert is considered a bank and it doesn't matter how long it is, uh, there's case studies out there that as long as those two points connect, um, you do have the connection of the resource area. So in my mind, the culvert without doubt connects the Bloody Brook. Now, how does the culvert connect to those wetland areas um, that are on the state right away as well as on the subject site? And I have never screen shared and I would love to try to do it unless someone else has um, that video that we had uh, supplied to the commission because that shows very clearly that depression that you saw in the grass um, that connected. So where you had the wetland plants and the depression, and I agree, it does go up into an upland area next as you're getting close to the culvert. And then as you're, as, as that area where you're, where you're coming out of the depression, there is a very clearly defined grass lined channel. And that channel is what takes the water from that depression and then flows through the channel Oh, fantastic. Um, yeah, feel free to play that. So that channel there is really overflowing right now. Um, and you can see the center line of the channel that comes from the wetland and that's going straight into the catch basin. So whatever water uh, is on this site and whatever happens on the site in the future, you know, this is very important. This is a direct connection to Bloody Brook. So we wanna make sure that we're protecting Bloody Brook, as well as these bordering vegetated wetlands that are connected to this channel. So, um, you know, also the photographs that are in my report show this channel during different conditions when it's not flowing quite as much and it's just standing. So when you were looking at that aerial that um, Austin politely put up on the screen, that dark depression is where this water flows and that's the remnants of this flowing water. So um, I think we'd be really hard pressed to see this for, for a period of time, unless we start getting um, you know, hurricane type rain uh, for a long period of time, we are really dry. And um, you know, we won't be able to visually observe this, but we can observe that depression that is in the grass swale, which uh, that depression just isn't there on its own. Somebody didn't care to dig it out. Um, and if they did, it was to try to drain the wetland would be my assumption. Um, and then that directly connects to where you can see the scour and the sediment deposits that enter into that culvert. Um, just to kind of tilt back to the regulations. So, um, you know, for a stream, it really just means, I'm gonna just read the regulations right from 10.04 as uh, Marianne had referenced. It means a body of running water, including brooks and creeks, which moves in a definite channel in the ground due to a hydraulic gradient. So we were seeing that definite channel and the hydraulic gradient, which flows within, into or out of an area subject to protection. So it's flowing out of an area, which we believe is a bordering vegetated wetland because this connects it. A portion of a stream may flow through a culvert or beneath a bridge such body of running water, which does not flow throughout the year, which is intermittent, is a stream except for the portion of gradient of all bogs, streams, wet meadows, and marshes. Um, the other section too that's important is bank. And you know this would meet also the definition of bank because of the fact that banks can be um, artificial, they can be um, grass lined, they can be concrete, they can be pavement, they can be in a parking area. So really we are um, experiencing this connection. And if you look on that, what you have up right now, um, I'm not sure has, who has control over the uh, screen there, but on that uh, diagram that we have, if you can see that line below CV1 that you, that you just circled, that line there, that dark line, that's what connects the catch basin to those bordering vegetated wetlands, um, which connect to Bloody Brook, a very important resource. Um, so we feel very strongly that the historic evidence that we have of the flows within this area show, 
you know, here we go, photograph one on the left. You know, this is something way past the storm event and it's still showing the channelization that's occurred that discharges this water. Um, and all these photographs are showing that on different dates. So it, it's just a really bad time of year to be evaluating this without some historic data. Um, so we hope that our historic data helps you in your decision um, on this being a bordering vegetative wetland. And there you have the on uh, photograph seven, uh, that's the, the stormwater um, system, the, the pipe that's coming from the culverting system that's discharging into Bloody Brook. And then you can see the outfall of the culvert Bloody Brook behind the basketball that somehow got down there uh, and never got its way back up. And then the, the remainder of those photographs there that you're scrolling through are showing the Bloody Brook on uh, dry with exception of photograph 10. Uh, photograph 10 is what Marianne was describing as this path trail uh, swale that runs behind the um, subdivision and also behind the dinosaur shop and it really connects all the way to a wetland on, that's adjacent to Bloody Brook. That there looks like it might have been created to make sure water could get away from some of the development. Um, I know a railroad track used to be in this area so I think that's why this right away is so wide. And another thing to mention is that because you had a railroad track, you had a state highway built, these soils are not in pristine condition. While they are um, mapped out, I think there definitely is um, microtopog microtopography, which gives variations because of all the work that was done. Now, in these two photographs here, 11 and 12, this is an area that is between the farm field and the right of way. And it really clearly shows that there's standing water there long enough where plants don't want to grow. And there's water stained leaves. The soils that I was finding there um, qualify as hydric. And I want to be very careful about how we think about hydric soils as well, where, you know, a lot of times we feel that the water needs to be coming up from the ground and rising up into the soil profile where we have the root zone in order to become hydric. Well, it doesn't matter where that zone is and where it comes from. It can be coming from up above and having that, that um, restrictive layer holding that water up, which as Marion described is the conditions of the site. So, you know, these soils would qualify as hydric. And then, you know, this is something I think on photograph 15 that we'd want to look at a little bit more closely. But what I was seeing was very interesting where the vegetation that's green is standing perfectly upright. It hasn't seen a rain event. It hasn't seen any flows because we haven't had any. If you look at the vegetation that's pushed down, that is brown, um, that vegetation is kind of in whatever direction. It's like it grew up, it got really dry, and it died. It just couldn't handle the season. But then when you see the water-stained vegetation that's laying down, that water stain vegetation is all facing in one direction, indicating that there was flow when we had flow, when we had water. So um, it's my interpretation that this area would then be an interconnection from the field to the right-of-way wetlands that are closer to Route 5. Um, the field that's on the subject property, I did not have an opportunity to access, which would be beyond the auger in photograph 16 there. Um, because it was, you know, on private property, but I could see that these sensitive fern were, and sedges and rushes were continuing on the property. And it sounds like Marianne saw the same thing. Um, where I'm standing there with that auger, there's adventitious roots, there's oxidized rhizospheres. You know, there's a, there's a good amount of water back here. And I think it's important for these areas to be identified so that they can be protected um, and eventually Bloody Brook is, is protected as well. Um, thank you so much for scrolling through these photos. I really appreciate it. Uh, so photograph 18 and, or 17 and 18 here, um, when you're looking south um, from standing on the road or the access drive to the subject property, as Marianne was, was describing, there's about a 10 by 10 area that has hydric vegetation. And if you look at my 2018 report, um, I have a photograph actually in there of the soil conditions which do qualify as hydric soils. So that would be qualified as a wetland. And then looking at photograph 18, now we're looking north and uh, you can see Marianne's flag right there. I think that was hit three for Marianne. Um, 
And in that location, you do have the hydric soils and it's really kind of clear in this photograph where you can see that light green vegetation and then it turns really dark green all of a sudden and the, um, you know, the upland vegetation starts to come in, but everything there and then into the tree line, um, which would be to the west, uh, had hydric conditions. So that would be your area of a wetland. Now, these areas also do confine standing water. So while we do have this discharge point, point which is back by that white car there, um, which we saw with, with the flowing water in the um, video, you know, the other questions I have is this isolated land subject to flooding. We're asking about jurisdiction and what I'm seeing is that this area is part of the request for jurisdiction is this right away. Um, is also a bordering land subject to flooding because of the fact that the, the study on the, um, the flood study ended before this portion of the site. So, you know, do we have that on this property? So um, that to me is not clear at this point either. So I think doing a calculation to see if the area below the outfall here shown in photograph one, you know, that elevation below where water can pond and it doesn't discharge via bank and the stream flow to the culvert, is that area also considered ILSF um, as well as BBW? Um, let's see. So, you know, I think that's really the gist of it. I can, I can get to, into it a lot more, but I, the report really has everything in it and both reports together give quite a bit of information. Um, we have obtained uh, letters so that um, this applicant can access, you know, we worked with the Mass DOT to get letters to access their property and do work on that, their property. Um, so we have that there for any work that needs to be done. Also, the, um, the dinosaur property, as well as those subdivision properties have given permission for access for evaluation, which I think is important because those buffer zones would then reflect onto the property. Um, yeah, so it's our understanding that these are bordering vegetative wetlands because of this connection with that grass swale that leads to the catch basin that leads to bloody brook. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I have a question. This is Louis Mission. And I, I'm looking over your pictures here. And I notice there's certain dates. They're, they're all kind of random. And in different times of year, which creates a different scenario on the ground absorption. And temperature wise, I noticed some of these are you know, one of I think one of your early reports was in December, mm -hmm. showing a wet area, which is wet everywhere in Deerfield. And the average temperatures, I think, were in the high 30s, 40s. Do you have any weather background to when these were taken? Was there a storm prior to these pictures? Because, no, you I know, it's... You got some here on in in uh, March, which is if it does rain, the area is not going to dry very fast. And if there's a multiple rain, and it's a drainage area for the state. I work for the state highway department, and I know those are swales for drainage. They're not maintained, or they haven't been other than mowed. So. Some of these pictures to me, I'm not saying they're right or wrong with the areas wet, but I just find it just curious about when they were taken and why they were taken at certain times with, uh, you know, different times of the uh, year, which is the same thing as a drought taking a picture now. That's, that's my, my concern. I hear you. Um, we can definitely go back and see what the, the rainfall characteristics were prior to these dates so we get a little bit more data to go behind it. Um, if you notice that the one that was in July, photograph two, you know, that one there, everything's dry around it, even though, you know, it's not like it's still saturated, it didn't just rain, um, but it may have rained just previously, but it had time to dry out. The sun was shining at that point. Um, which one is this? What photograph? 
photograph number two. Okay. So, and so, um, and then photograph I did, I did, I did happen to look because I just find it interesting that, uh, and uh, I, I don't know the exact weather for this area, but it was under the Boston, Massachusetts, and they, they, they showed a quarter inch on the day before and a half inch that day, the 27th of eight, of seven, 27, 18. So that's, that's all. I just curious, you know, we're looking at pictures that are supposed to be kind of normal pictures, not pictures that, and it's the same as with the drought now too, you know, everything looks dry and everything else. I, that's all. I just want to put that into perspective that, that, uh, you know, you got a wet area and, it, and it's supposed to take water after a rain and it's supposed to flow like that. That that's what was, you know, that's what the intent was for that area. I don't know about the field and stuff. I'm not talking about that. It's just these, these pictures here in the road or right away. Yeah. So I just thought I'd throw that in just to, no, thank you. you. Know, my, my concern is more the isolated wetlands. What are really the isolated areas? Yeah. You know, this is a drainage area. That's that's my interpretation. And like I say, after working for the highway department and living in Deerfield for all these years, it is a wet area. It's flat. And uh, so, you know, this isn't something unusual for this area and and it does dry you drive up towards yankee candle and you see those drainage ditches those are full of water after heavy rains but then they dry right up so that's that's all i'm just bringing that point up yeah and to answer you know these were not selected um they were selected because we need to know what residents had photographs of it because you know, this came up and um, we're in a drought, so we don't have an opportunity to observe this, you know, during the spring, we weren't out there getting all these photographs like we would have liked to for the whole spring, um, observing a little bit more closely. So we kind of needed to pull together whatever we did have for data so that we could present that. And my take on this is, you know, even though, if you look back, actually, I have a photograph from 1992 attached uh, it's a Google Earth photograph and, you know, it's kind of hard to interpret, but you can kind of see on that photograph that there's a bunch of little riblets uh, adjacent to the subdivision. And I don't know if it was something that started because of the subdivision, um, but when you look even further back, you can kind of see standing water on either side of a railroad track um, in this area as well. So to me, this area has always been an area that has had issues with groundwater. Um, and when I stand out on the site, if this was not something that happened routinely, there wouldn't be a depression that led from point A to point B, meaning from the wetlands to the catch basin. So that depression is there for a reason because it happens often enough to create that connectivity to make it worth protecting. So Louis, um, yep. Bill Mayer, PC. Um, uh, if I could say number one, uh, I appreciate very much that we're focusing on science uh, tonight. That we're focusing on, uh, you know, taking a look at 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 this information from a scientific perspective. Um, and the one thing that that's really jumping out at me um, because it is one of our responsibilities um, uh, to enforce the provisions of the Wet Wetland Protection Act, and that is to also attempt. Uh, to prevent pollution and storm damage, uh, especially to the Bloody Brook. Um, so I, I do think if we we can't we can't lose sight of that. We you know because um, you know that certainly is focusing on the science and. Um, yeah, I, no, I I agree with you. It, it, this isn't something that just happened overnight. It's been draining. The fields. I, I, I'm not. I'm not saying there isn't any wetland or any any wet spots or anything like that. I'm just saying that this has been happening for for years. That farmers set up a 
a swale or something just to send water down to, so they could work their fields. And I think a lot of that is when it does rain, it, the water does go down. And uh, does that create a wetland because the water flows off? It's. Uh, but but I think the real question here might be that, and thank you both for your presentations. They're were, they were very good. I appreciate the you know, professionalism on both sides. And, and obviously there were some similarities, but um, two different conclusions. But I, I think one of the questions in my mind uh, uh, to the commission is, we've heard that there's at least isolated wetlands in the, in the parcels that we're looking at. Um, and we saw yesterday, you could see the connectivity to that um, discharge basin. And if that discharge basin uh, um, is connected into the Bloody Brook um, watershed type of thing, if, if everything coming out there, is that the connectivity that we have to consider whether it's been you know, done that way for 200 years by the farmers or not? In this case, are we looking at the connection between these identified, even if it's isolated wetlands, to that connection to the, um, to the Bloody Brook? And I, and I think Bill brought up a, an interesting point of, uh, of not just the wetland protection, but the overall protections of, uh, of that, um, that little watershed there. So yeah, there's two questions you're looking at. You know, one is how to protect Bloody Brook, and that could be answered not just through conservation, but whatever planning board or zoning board does with stormwater. Every, project has stormwater that involves any kind of pavement need, that you need to control in some fashion and make sure that the stormwater leaves the site in a, in a renovated condition um, and uh, avoiding peak flows and so on and, and uh, flooding people out. Uh, I had a project um, over the uh, winter through the summer of 2018 in central Massachusetts. It was the wettest year on record. We had, we were, by July, we were easily five inches above normal at that point. Um, the site I had was a two lot subdivision. It was horrible. We were constantly washing out. Uh, the hillside was slumping. It was, it, I never saw anything like it. I could not keep up with erosion control measures. Everything we did was overwhelmed by the amount of water right through the summer of 2018. Um, so you have to be careful what we're looking at there. There was definitely a lot of water coming down that and that swale beside the highway is designed to carry the water away from the highway. Um, and the, the fields do overflow at some point, they're ephemeral. If they flow in the response, to, in response to just storm events, uh, that's an ephemeral situation. That's something that would not be protected by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and I contend that it would not be considered a stream channel um, if it's just re in response to uh, weather events like that. And, and I think that not looking at the pictures under any given weather event, but just thinking of the underlying connection to the wetlands, which um, then that connects to the state law and is it bordering a wetland because of that connection and I think you and Kate may have different opinions, whether it's a stream or a channel or uh, yeah. a, a culvert or a dam. Um, and that raises to me, you know, after two good professional um, presentations that maybe we need uh, a third independent tiebreaker. <laughs> um, this is Tim Hilchey. Um, I just want to follow up with what Pete's saying um, with a couple of questions and I'm not, I don't care if Kate Bednout's answers or Marion DePinto answers. Um, <clears throat> without knowing how these channels are created, whether they're banks or you're calling them a swale, you're calling them a bank, um, without having some historical knowledge, is there, any, is there any point in law that says, if water's flowing from a, a, a wetland area through a bank slash swale to another wetland area that discharges into um, a bordering vegetated wetland and a, and a stream uh, system. 
is the law agnostic about how the lines got there? I mean, does it say if a farmer dug this trench and then the field was no longer being farmed and the trench is still there and it's connecting a wetland to another wetland, is it still um, a connection under law? Or is this something that a third independent study could help us with? And leave that to you, Marianne, if you wanted to go first. Well, it is probably some case law, uh, adjudicatory hearings on what's a stream and what's not a stream. Uh, it's my experience that, that what I was seeing out there is not considered a stream channel, a defined channel. Yeah, there's, there's a rivulet that you can kind of see something through the grass. Now, when you look at the video, say, well, that the water does move that way. Uh, of course it does, but I didn't see what I would consider a uh, a connection, uh, the kind of connection, uh, a defined channel, per se. Oh. And Tim, to, to answer your question on, on my perspective is that, um, no, I don't think it matters how it got there. It just matters how it's functioning now. And, you know, as a board, you know, the charge is to protect the wetland resource areas. So if you have that connectivity, you know, if you are working on in the state right away, the highways, they're digging, you know, a deeper swale or a deeper trench or a deeper wetland. And then all of a sudden that, that discharge, that sediment starts going in its channel that is already there, that the, the water already has found a path to the catch basin with purpose, I believe, um, originally. And that sediment then discharges into that catch basin. It goes to Bloody Brook and it goes to whatever resources are connected to that. And that's important. Um, so if there wasn't at this time of year, you know, that, that little ankle twister of a swale in the, in the grass area, then, um, then I would agree with Marianne. But the fact that that's there and it's well established, it's very hardened, it's, it's been used and it's used a lot. And, um, you know, something that could be done is putting this on hold until we start getting some different conditions out there. But I, who knows how long that will take with how bad we are into this drought right now. That might be fairly significant. So, um, but there definitely is case law out there about this connectivity and, um, you know, using catch basins and then going through culverts. And, you know, the amazing thing that I find is it could be going through a hundred miles of stormwater drainage culverts. And if it connects on either end to a wetland, it's jurisdictional. Um, the semantics of that are a little bit different to talk about, but you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting way to think about what we do. And one follow-up question then. Um, the large, uh, if, if we were to require, as Pete Law suggested, Tim Hilchy, sorry, um, as Pete Law suggested, um, a delineation of the subject property, the right-of-way and the, the, the abutting properties, um, they, that would establish where, whether they're isolated or whether they're uh, jurisdictional, um, where the wetlands are in this area. So there would be some benefit to all of the property owners to know this. Um, so uh, in addition to answering the, the specific question about this RDA, um, it would be beneficial for all the parties that are affected by this, I would think. Um. Okay, I think Mark Donahue, did you did you want to ask some questions, or were you planning on asking any questions to Kate or or the board? No, I don't. I don't have any particular questions. I, I think I just got to clarify. Um, this language makes a difference uh, here. And Mr. Hinchy's question was whether when you come from a wetland through a stream to another wetland, which presupposes that the isolated areas do constitute a wetland as that term is used in the Wetlands Protection Act, which is the gravamen of this entire discussion. So the board shouldn't be confused by that. That's really kind of the question. Okay. Uh, I, the board. 
Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, just, you know, just as a reminder, what other resource areas are we not considering? You know, are we, have we evaluated ILSF, VLSF? You know, have we looked into both of those to make sure that those are not um, resource areas that would contribute to, to protection in these areas? And, and also clarifying, you know, this, this project area, the, the, the area description, you know, the area description is including the right-of-way. And there was some discussion earlier about um, that the right of way wasn't part of this, but yet the report does does discuss the right of way. So I'm pretty unclear on those things myself. The only point. Really the reason for the right of way being mentioned is to look for something bordering, you know, to try to determine whether or not the wetland area that's on the, those lots or on one of the lots uh, was in fact bordering or not. So I had to look through the right of way, but I was not making a determination of anything on the right of way itself, other than to see if there was a stream channel that connected that isolated wetland uh, to make it bordering. Also, ILSF, the area would have to hold a quarter acre foot of water, average depth of six inches, and it, it, there was nothing, no evidence there to say that they, would, they could hold that much water before it overflowed. Uh, all, eventually, all isolated land subject to flame overflows at, you know, at some point. Uh, well, makes it maybe except for a quarry or something like that. The 10,000 year storm, maybe. Kate's question a while ago made me go back and look at the, R the RDA. And um, if you look at um, BA, it's checked off, you know, whether the area depicted on the plans and or maps referenced below is an area subject to jurisdiction of the Wetlands Protection Act and C project description, uh, C1B area description, farm fields at the corner, and the state right, uh, Route 5 right away. So I meant at the corner. A fine point here that I'm not lawyer enough to know about, Louis, but it, it does seem to it was my be a little bit more expanded than the, the lots behind the right of way uh, by the sheer language of the RDA. So it might be a point. It was my poor wording, I suspect. I, I was trying to describe it as the lots of budding the right of way and you know, being at the corner of Mill Village and the right of way. So was the, the right of way was the boundary of the lots. Yeah, I, I'm just reading the language and I, I'm not a lawyer, so I, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It, it does, in the first part, it's a bold of the area uh, in, in BA and then in C1, B is the area description. I assume those are a one-to-one -one correlation. So um, it, it, it is a fine point. Maybe you have to, it's good to be pointed out anyways. No, thanks, Pete. I'm, I'm just looking at it now, trying to. Yeah, I, I just pulled it up. I, I'm an old school. I have to have it in hard copy to get anything done. It, 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 it does sound like to me the farm fields at the corner of Mill Village and the state right away. It sounds like that the borders are the state right away on yes. Route 5 and Mill and Village Road. That's that's kind of, I, I do read it that way myself. I don't, yeah, know, if that's, I I don't know if that's how you read it. Have a parenthesis before the end or without a parenthesis. <laughs> A comma, I, for, I forget how that works, but uh, well, um, standalone. Louis, this, this is Tim Hilchey. Um, regardless of, uh, you know, the fine points of grammar on that, um, you know, it can be read either way, and I don't think it really matters for our discussion tonight. What I found to be instructive is that both parties have found wetland areas, and the question is, are they jurisdictional? And, right. Um, there's, a, there's large areas of agreement on this and there's a couple of areas of disagreement. And the, the only way I see that for the Conservation Commission to make an informed decision is to get a third party independent, paid for by the developer, so that the, the and is selected by um, the, the Conservation Commission, so it can be an independent voice talking to the Conservation Commission and have them study the site and the surrounding areas to determine what's what. 
because we've got two professionals saying essentially the same thing about a lot of stuff and having the disagreement about connectivity. And, um, you know, each of them probably has their allegiance to who hired them. So if the Conservation Commission can hire an independent um, professional wetland scientist, soil scientist to do a study of this whole area, then we can get to the science and make it a t make it an informed decision. Yeah, no, no, you're, you're right. And that's what I figured we were going to end up doing either that or if we could all agree, which doesn't sound like I don't think we could, that there would be an appeal to DEP. So the, the only thing to really do is to, uh, you know, do a independent study on this and a peer review on the information that was that's available here. And what happens there is for the peer review, we, we put out for some uh, requests for uh, estimates to have this reviewed. And we present those estimates to the uh, applicant who picks out or he, he decides which how much money he wants to spend. If he has one applicant that goes for, that wants, you know, $5,000 to do a review or one that wants 10,000, we can't make, we can't pick the, that person out or that company out. He, he says he'll take, he'll pay the 5,000 and we'll have it done, but it's a contract with us, but they pay for it. They have to agree to pay for it. So it, it's a contract to, to the town. We write a contract out. Right. Well, if, so, if I might, sorry. Yeah. Um, well, certainly the, as I in, indicated at my opening, um, we, we've been in this process for a while uh, and we're familiar with peer review. Um, uh, what we would suggest to the board um, is to make sure that there's some understanding as to the scope of the peer review, um, which we would expect to be to review the materials that have been submitted by the applicable uh, consultants and to conduct a site visit uh, to evaluate it on their own and look at any other historical information they need. As to the identity of that, uh, we have had already review by the town, by peer review, of this project as to the work being done on it. That was done by the very reputable firm of tie and bond retained by the town via the planning board through a similar process. They have the benefit of knowing the site because they've been on the site, they've seen it, they've evaluated before um, issues with regard to stormwater control and the like. Uh, certainly have a, a reputation with the town as fair and independent because they've been retained by the town for other purposes for that purpose. And we would suggest that, that, that they be solicited for a proposal and we're glad to agree to a reasonable amount of compensation for them to do their work and turn it around pretty promptly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a question for um, Mr. Donahue. Um, I want him to clarify what he means by um, what materials are you asking them to, were you saying should be reviewed? Just the things that your, your, uh, your client presented no, not at all. Okay, what, I just wanted I, to what, clarify that. What, I would certainly think that they would look at the information that, that was submitted by Ms. DePinto. I would assume that they would be provided and would review Ms. Bednow's uh, uh, information also. Um, whether because this is recorded or elsewhere, they can be provided the 2018 video that was demonstrated to the board. I assume that they'll do an independent site visit at a time that's convenient for them and we'll make sure that they have access to the site to do that. Um, we'll make sure it includes areas within the right of way that are proximate to the work so there's no confusion there about delineation lines. Um, but that's what they would do. There was other talk about a separate independent delineation in some fashion. I'm not sure what that is for a request for determination where our position is there are no jurisdictional wetlands. Right, right. I mean, it'd be, uh, this is Louis Mission, just, uh, it would be a, just a review of the site. There's nothing, no delineation, just 
what what their uh, take is on the site, review all the reports, and you know give us a report and uh, for uh, another meeting. That, that, that's pretty much it, and we'll we'll have to we'll include Ty and Bond as one of the uh, outfits to be uh, solicited, and uh, with a number of others, and see what we get back. If that that sounds fine, yeah, Mark. This is Pete. I'm I'm glad you said. Yeah, um, Ty and Bond has worked on this, so we're looking for a a, a real third party. Uh, and, and, may, and you know they can come through with a very um, objective review, I'm sure. But if we should expand it on to to a number of consultants, uh, but just be, you said just a peer review and review of the system. But don't we really want a hydrologist and a, a geo specialist and a wetland specialist to 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 do the work to to connect the dots here that seem to be missing on between the connectivity and the bordering question? Those seem to be the two big ones. And can that be done by just review, or do do we have to have someone to do some some actual in field work? I, I just want that clarification. I wasn't quite sure from your comments. Yeah, uh, Louis, it, it, yeah, this is Tim Hilchy again. Um, the reason why I asked the question is because you've got two two pieces of contiguous property. On one hand, um, Mary Depento says there are wetlands. On the on the on the subject site, there are areas that have wetland vegetation um, and so if all you look at is the 50 by 50 foot space that doesn't tell you anything about the wetland system and we're charged with protecting the wetland system and to the extent that the piece of land is part of a larger wetland system we need to know that um, so if we did a delineation on any property in town um, for somebody who wanted to build a house and they hired somebody to delineate a wetland, they would, if, if the wetland goes into an, an adjacent property, then they have to go and ask that property owner, can I go out and finish the delineation of this wetland? And so that's, that's my point about this is that you ask one question, you can only look at 50 by 50 foot piece of land, you get a totally different answer than if you're asking, what is the wetland condition in this area? And how does it affect the proposal to do something on this subject piece of land. So I'm not sure a peer review is adequate to what we need to know as a board to make a decision, but that's, that's my opinion. So that was my question too, Tim, is, is, is would it be adequate or not? There seems to be so many questions raised tonight that as we put this out for, um, you know, proposal, you know, what's the scope? And everybody have to agree to it, but it seemed to be a little bit more than a peer review. And I, I just wasn't sure what, if that was a definition that you were talking about, Tim, or not. Or Louis, sorry. Yeah, no, normally under the peer reviews that, you know, that we've had done, they actually go out. It's not just look at the paperwork. They're going to go out and, and do the whole site. It's not just, we don't know where the wetland is, if there is any. They're isolated. We, we, we don't tell them where it is. They go out and they'll go out and look the whole site over and come up with their own review and uh, what they found. And not getting back to semantics, but is the whole site, the area, including the, uh, the right of way? Uh, I don't, I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's unclear on the RDI. So. Um, Julia, and by the way, um, it looks like Kate Bednaz is putting her hand up. <laughs> oh, sorry, Kate. Yeah, go, 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 sorry. I feel like I'm in class. So I'm like, hi, can I talk? <laughs> but uh, thank you for recognizing Tim. Um, I just want to, to, since you're having this discussion, just put a reminder in that in the most recent report that we submitted for August 23rd, 2020, that there is permission to access these adjacent lands. So. Um, we know we feel it would be proper to also include anything where a buffer may extend onto, I believe what we're calling the subject property. So this would include the um, properties behind the dinosaur shop as well as the subdivision. And, you, and because the letter is there allowing permission for those types of investigations, I think it's very uh, reasonable to have a third party uh, evaluate everything that touches that um, that field property, and that's all. 
Now, does the town have that letter, Kate? Yes. It, it, yes, it's in my report. It's one of the attachments. There's actually three letters, one from the state, uh, one from the, um, Gina, and one from the residents over in the subdivision. Okay. And they can update that if you'd like. Okay, Mark? Um, I think we're making this maybe a little bit more complicated than it has to be, um, because this is a, a request for determination of applicability. Um, you know, there's a fair amount of information, including historical information that's provided in the respective reports. The site isn't that big. And by the site, I have no problem in including the, the, the right of way as the defined site. I okay. expect that anybody qualified that you're going to retain after we approve of it is going to go out on the site and evaluate all of the site uh, to look for indicators of wetlands, much like Ms. Bednaus has, like Ms. DePinto went, you know, they weren't directed to some area and only look here and don't look, don't look behind the curtain or something. So it, it's, it's all manageable. It's, a, it's an extension of review. If they need to, as part of that evaluation, access abutting properties and consent's been given by the owners, then they'll do that as part of being a responsible wetland scientist. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think it, it has to be a lot more complicated than that. What it, what, it, it's, what it can't be is it a third full-blown analysis that all of a sudden starts taking, you know, samples downstream and everything else. You know, um, you've got enough work here to decide. Basically, you have to, you're looking for somebody to assist you in making a determination on the applicant's report. No, I, I agree with you, Mark. And that, that's what I, I think that usually happens with our peer reviews. And, uh, Great. You know, I don't think we need to get into anything else other than have the right away and the property uh, you know looked at by a third party or fourth party whatever it is third party so louis just a, a question then on a peer review if, if they do come up with a gap analysis and there's there's missing data that we're not giving them the ability to check out now then do we go then is it a fourth round or <laughs> Do we give somebody more uh, authority now to, to, to do the gap analyses and, and go through the whole thing? Because that seems to be where we're at now is the difference of opinion. What are the gap analyses? Let me start over. That, you know, if we do a peer review, they're going to say, well, this one said this, this, this is my opinion on what's already been done versus uh, the additional gap analyses. And, uh, and I'm just asking, I don't know enough of the, the process. And Mark, I appreciated your... Uh, your outline of, of the process there, but there's, there's still a question of, you know, what if we, what if there's something that's found that becomes still a gap? How do, how do those questions get close? Uh, the board can make a decision. Uh, I think we have a lot of questions still right now. All right. I don't know. This sounds like a huge project that we're getting into here. All it is is a field and whether there's isolated wetlands or not, that's my feeling. And I think a third or a peer review is what you normally do and what you know we are allowed to do and uh, I think we take it from there I mean is it, it, it's going to be either yes or no you know it's not going to be more questions that I see you know it's just you're going to drag this on for two years or you know it's all our other big projects we have peer reviews and what what the engineering firm or consultant firm uh, finds and questions the applicant's engineer or uh, consultant has to explain the differences so that that's that's what usually happens you know if they find something they, they'll have questions it's it's not just you know what i'm saying mr chairman it looks like there are two people that are, would like to make a comment i i'm not sure if mr donahue and Ms. Shriver, um, we're looking to speak. Oh. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to our original. Can you identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Debbie Shriver, uh, resident of Deerfield. Uh, our original request for, through Deerfield for responsible development is that we have a wetlands delineation. So, uh, you know, it, it is in a sense to be able to show the, the, the full picture and the connections, not just here's a spot, here's a spot, here's a spot, 
um, it, 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 it's the whole point is to weave a full picture of, of what are the condition of wetlands, how are they linked, where do they begin, where do they end. It's, it's a full, it's a measurement of the extent of the, of the wetland conditions. And that's, that's what we're seeking. So a peer review in a certain sense sounds, when we say that word, peer review, then we're talking about uh, much more closely uh, Ms. DePinto's work versus Ms. Bednaz's. And, and that isn't, that, that, just, uh, that just brings you to a, a third opinion. Um, this is, so this is, a, this is, we're asking that you conduct a delineation. I just wanted to, to bring that forward. And that was also, I believe, part of Ms. Bednaz's uh, recommendation in her report. Okay, thank you. I don't have any comment. If I might, Mr. Donahue. If I might, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to get back to the member's question about you know, what if there's a gap in some fashion of information. Uh, it, it's, I don't, I don't expect it here because I don't think the scope of the issue is, is broad enough, but part of peer review is an iterative process and it often involves whoever's looking at the work coming back and posing certain questions, and then it becomes incumbent upon the applicant to provide the responses to those. So if the result is we can't really conclude that the applicant is accurate without X or Y, they'll say that and we'll deal with it at that time, whatever it might be. So it, I, I think in just doing it, I, I don't mean to minimize it in the tried and true vanilla way of peer review, of reviewing the information as submitted and determining whether it's been done in a professional fashion and their own conclusions that any of the firms that you've used in the past are probably going to be able to do this. Yeah, we've, we've had, you know, there's, there's, there's a number of firms that are out there sure. to, to do it and they've done work for us. And, and, you know, I don't think there's been any complaints. So uh, I have confidence in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have confidence in the, uh, you know, having a peer review done, if the board uh, agrees to that, or if they got any other comments. Just one more comment, and I uh, don't want to uh, continue with this, but the, the request was for the wetlands delineation. Um, so are we going to look at that wetlands delineation within the peer review, or is it a peer review without a wetlands delineation? aspect well if if they come up with that there isn't any wetlands then there's no need for spending money or having another consultant do a, a wetland um, delineation and if there is wetlands that he agrees there is then that'll be required through a notice of intent, if there's our jurisdiction, then we will require a notice of intent, which a notice of intent will have to mark out all the wetlands on the plans for what whatever they want to, you know, make or not make, but uh, build or, or uh, build, you know, whatever work they want to do on the property, I guess I want to say. You know what I'm saying, Pete? It'll be part of a notice of intent that they have to have it all marked out with an engineer or a wetland scientist, but we can't just go out there random and have it marked. Mm -hmm. Well, Louie, this is uh, following up on Pete Tim Hilchey. Um, <clears throat> It seems that there's no disagreement on either party, uh, you know, F F FWS or Three Oaks. There are wetlands areas. So that's not even really a question for discussion at this point. Um, and so the question becomes, what is, what is the board, the Conservation Commission need in order to grant a three-year RDA for this project? And if it is, we need to understand the um, wetlands systems that are in place there and determine whether they're connected, then that's what the board needs in order to be able to say, 
we want to, will grant an RDA. Um, and that's, that's where I'm at. If, if the science says that these are, even though there's 300, 3,000 or 4,000 square feet of wetlands areas, if they're isolated, then that ends the discussion. But unless you can define what those wetland areas are, and even if a small portion of them are on the subject property, then that seems to me to be the crux of this thing. We need to understand, are these wetlands isolated or are they connected? And if we're talking about a 50 by 50 foot area on the, the subject site, I'm not comfortable with saying that that's the wetlands. Um, so peer review is not the same thing as delineation. And if delineation and peer review can happen together, if we hire GZA, for instance, who we just did the 144 Main Street, I think it was, or maybe they were the ones that did the, uh, the soccer field area. Um, they need to be able to say, I, in order to give you an answer, I need to be able to go onto the condo site, I need to be able to go onto the dinosaur shop site, I need to be able to go into the right of way, and I need to be able to go onto the subject property to determine where, where are wetland conditions and, and do they connect? Because if they connect, then it's a different thing than if they don't connect. So my feeling is we need to have this information in order to make the RDA. But I could be wrong and uh, I'm willing to, you know, do whatever the board thinks is, is the proper course of action. So, so Tim, I, I, I'm, I'm still a little confused. When we do a, a peer review, it's not, he's not just going over the paperwork that's already out there. He's supposed to go, or whoever's doing it, is supposed to go out there and look at the whole site, which will. That's what I'm saying, Louis. We're having a semantic discussion here, and I'm saying the wetlands exist in three or four properties, and you're saying the site. So if the wetlands exist in three or four properties and part of it is in on a subject site, then how can you give an RDA that disregards that there are wetlands all around the subject site? So all I'm trying to find out is, are these isolated wetlands or are they connected wetlands? And if they're isolated, then that ends the discussion. But if they're connected, it changes the discussion. So peer review for the site doesn't get to the answer that we need, in my opinion. Well, what, what do you think uh, the peer review is going to do? I, I mean, don't know. They're gonna, they're, well, they're supposed to look at everything out there. You, look you at yourself the, just said the site. Wow. And so I want to know before I agree to something that it's not going to be limited to two parcels of land that touch on in contiguous wetland areas. No, it includes this. It includes the right away. That's that's what uh, that's what Mark said. He was he'd accept that too. That it would be the whole lot, both lots, and the uh, and the right away. That's so. I don't know. That still, that still doesn't answer the question of if we hire a peer review guy and he wants to go into the condo land. Is that going to be acceptable to Mr. Donahue? If they want to go into the dinosaur shop land, is that going to be acceptable, Mr. Donahue? I if, I might, no. if I might, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Like I, I, purposely or not, we're trying to make, this has become more confusing. What the, what the request for determination of applicability says is a request to you to determine whether there's any area on the site that constitutes a jurisdictional area subject to the Wetlands Protection Act. When, when reference is made that there is agreement that there were wetlands on the site, there is agreement that there are wetland species on the site. But the seminal question is, is it connected in some fashion? Does it border in some fashion? But the question is whether it's on the site So the review is going to be of the site. We, we cannot, apparently it can be granted by others, grant permission to go on other property. And if they 
have that permission and believe it's important as part of their review to determine whether the any species that are on are on the site border wetland or uh, resources that are off the site then they'll be able to do that if they give it the permission but all of that work exists already the delineation becomes circular because uh, to delineate a wetland suggests that it is a wetland we're certainly not going we're not going to pay to delineate somebody's wetland on somebody else's property well that sounds like what you said if i can tin hilt you again what you said is that if we hire a peer review company um, that you agree to pay for and that peer review company is told you have permission to go on all of the contiguous sites to determine whether there's connectivity from any of these sites that can that also connects with the the subject site then that seems like what i'm looking for if you're saying that you're going to limit it to the site and that's all that's going to be peer reviewed, then that's not going to get me an answer that I'm comfortable with. Uh, hi guys, I it's think you Bill agree. Mayor PC. Um, I'm, I apologize to um, uh, interrupt, uh, Tim. Um, I, I, I wonder if this would help. What I'm hearing, um, and it is, you know, sometimes it's semantics, um, but what I'm hearing is difference between contiguous and connectivity. Um, and, um, you know, we, we've heard, um, uh, that, um, from Marianne de Pinto that there is a one isolated wetland. Um, if I could make a suggestion, would our motion be that the peer review is going to determine whether that one isolated wetland is contiguous to um, um, to other wetlands um, uh, and and would such um, um, you know be uh, enforceable uh, through the wetlands protection act um, does that help am I because I'm I'm really you know wanting to I can I can I speak? Um, I, I really don't want to focus on just one thing for a peer review. I'd rather have someone do the whole area. Let's put area, not site area. Have someone do the whole area, and and then tell us that they're able to find something else. You don't know. I don't know. You know I don't want to just say just do this one spot. You know what I'm saying? That's what it sounds like you're saying, Bill. I, 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 I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. That's okay. I mean, I'm in, I'm in agreement to using the word area. Um, um. Tim Hilchey, too, to follow up with what Bill's saying, and I think what you're saying, Louis, is um, since the peer review would encompass both the Three Oaks review, um, the Monroe or Monroe, I'm not sure what the previous one was, and the freshwater um, reviews, it's already asking for an area review. So as long as we use the word area or whatever, because if they're gonna look at those two reports or three reports or four reports, they all talk about different parts than the site. So that's all I'm saying. If it's a peer review of the area, that sounds like a way to go about this. Yeah, maybe, maybe I said it wrong, but that's what I assumed we were gonna do, so. Okay. I, I'm happy with that. Hi, you know. May, real quick. Yes. Is so Kate Bednaz. It just so w with the Wetlands Protection Act, you know, you're looking at all the different resource areas, the BLSF, the ILSF, the BVW, whether it's isolated, and the BVW would have a hundred foot buffer zone. So really, anything that's located within a hundred feet of that specific area that you want your determination matters in my opinion and that's all hi hi can i say something and who are you please hi i'm gina bordoni cowley i own the the dinosaur shop that uh is abutting the proposed site um i'll, I'll just say something quickly um 
I am in favor also of, of thinking about this um, in terms of connectivity because uh, both scientists were talking about that area behind the dinosaur shop uh, as a pathway. And I know that that area um, is wet. Uh, it may not be wet now because uh, we're in the middle of this drought, but um, during a typical year, there, there has been water there. And so that part to me connects to uh, the wet area in that field um, to the left of the shop that you were pointing to where the storm drain is. Um, that area um, that is grassy, uh, I'm not an environmental scientist, but that grassy area um, is, is always wet. Um, and then whenever uh, there is a rainstorm, of course that whole area becomes flooded not only in that parking lot where the storm drain is, but also right in the back of the shop where uh, all the dinosaurs are, uh, there can be, you know, a couple of feet even of water um, that is uh, typically just kind of standing there until, you know, it, it winds up draining through. But um, there seems to be, to me, uh, those areas that are somehow connected the behind the shop and to the left of the shop and probably in that backyard too. So to me, I think it's important to look at all those areas because they do all intersect at some point. Somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. I think she has. So, I I, I think I think we have chewed to death the, the scope of a peer review. Are, are you going to continue this meeting to a time in which you'll have those proposals? We can, uh, if you accept uh, to have a peer review done, I, uh, I make a motion to uh, uh, do a peer review on the information we have and continue the meeting till September 24th, and hopefully that information will be uh, available at that time. That's when our next meeting is. I'll, I'll second that motion of a peer review of the area. Uh, um, and, and, uh, and to continue the meeting. And to continue the meeting until September 24th. Thank you. Just a question before we go to a vote, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes. Will, will the, the ensuing 30 days be enough to do a proposal, put it out to bid, and then get it to the, the applicants for their review? It might not. I heard somebody asking of, to get a consultant to do some peer reviews, and they were having a, a, a tough time at that, at that time. But if, if not, we'll just, it'll just be continued when we have the next meeting. Mm -hmm. We will just continue it to the following meeting because what will happen a lot of times is the information will be just about ready and then the uh, applicant has to be able to address the questions that our peer review usually uh, comes up with okay so, so it, yeah. it, it could be it could be it could be ready and it might not be that's i, I don't know okay okay yeah so as long as the applicant is Tim Hilchie, again, as long as the applicant understands that, um, although we're setting September 24th for the date, that if we, we have difficulty getting the peer review done for that date, that we'll just move it to the next available date, then that's all I wanted to clarify. And it sounds like that's what you think is normal practice. Yes, it usually happens is, you know, if we can't, if we can't get done by then or the applicant doesn't have enough time to respond to the uh, questions brought up by the peer review, then we'll just continue it. And I assume the uh, applicant will agree to a continuation. The, the only thing I'd add, Mr. Chairman, is if, if it could be provided, if we could know before, um, certainly the 24th, uh, who the request for proposals has gone to, just so we have some idea. Oh. 
Oh, oh definitely. You'll you'll know Thank us you. when we when we get the uh, you know estimates in because you have to approve approve the uh, money for us. Sure. So uh, what Kevin, usually? I'm sorry. One one quick question. Do we have to define the uh, the the parameters of the peer review or before we vote on it, or is that subsequent, or does it need any more language around peer review? So the motion that's been seconded, um, Bill Mayor, PC, uh, Peter, um, the motion was, was made um, for a peer review of the area. Um, uh, I think area was the word that, that we were wondering about. Um, and a continuation um, of this meeting at this point until September 24th, 2020. I don't know, is that, Pete, does that, does help? that help or? The latter part of it helps. I, I just don't know uh, if, if peer review needs to be somewhat defined or if we do that after we um, vote and accept that and then define it what um, you know what the scope of the request for proposals would actually be uh, the truth normally it just we you know I think the office we just send it out and uh, ask for our, you know environmental wetlands review of that area one thing that might help Mr. Chairman is if we say, you know, to specifically examine the question of, you know, connectivity, the wetland, whatever wetland resources may be in the area, because the connectivity question is the one that seems to be driving this. I don't know if that helps Peter. Uh, it's Pete Law in, in a bit, um, you know, a peer review I'm sure it could have many definitions and I didn't know if it was our responsibility to um, uh, make that more specific or not. It was a, it was a more of a question of um, process. Sure. I, I think Bill Mayor PC again, I think we also, so we have a motion um, and that motion has been seconded. Um, Louie has added uh, something a little bit to the motion. Um, uh, and I and I think it's important now that that we do kind of get this out on the table and vote on it so that we can move forward. Um, um, so, would um, would the would Louis, who made the motion, um, accept an a, a, an amendment before uh, we move? the well, amendment well, would just just be to insert the language, um, the purpose of the peer review is to answer the question of connectivity to any wetland resources that may be in the area. In addition to- In addition to all normal functions of the peer review. On the environmental issues on the property or whether the area, you know, is uh, under jurisdiction of the Wetland Protection Act. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, well, that's basically what we, I think we do is, you know, that type of review, but. Okay. Yeah, I guess, you know, uh, Tim, uh, Bill Mayer, PC again, I'm, I, I'm, I, I think that we're starting to really kind of grasp at, at straws. I think that what Louie is saying is whether, you know, um, whether this is under jurisdiction of the Wetlands Protection Act, that, that's not. what we're, or not, yeah, uh, whether yeah. or not, um, uh, I think that's, what the peer review is. Okay, so if, if others are satisfied with that, that's an end of discussion for me. So, so um, uh, Louis, maybe I make a recommendation, maybe that you withdraw, we, we amend. Um, okay, uh, I, I, I make, <laughs> I make a, uh, a request to, uh, to change the uh, the peer review to include the the whole area and to uh, to have it uh, examined for to see if the area uh, 
is under the jurisdiction of the Wetland Protection Act. And to continue the meeting till the September 24, 2020. I'll second the motion. All those in favor? The Louis Mission, aye. Bill Mayor, PC, aye. Ben Byrne, aye. Eli, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Okay. I think that's that's it till hopefully we can have some more information by the next meeting there, Mark. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Oh. Do we need okay. to do any other business, Louis? Yeah, uh, we just got. Uh, did anybody look at the minutes? The yeah, I looked. At, I, I received them. I haven't looked at them. So, in the minutes that we'd be looking at, I believe, would be the May twenty eighth, two thousand twenty minutes, because we didn't meet in June or July. Correct. We we did review the minutes of five uh, five seven, and we did a we did approve May, those. May, of, Yep, and and I looked at the draft of the 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 one that uh, Bill Mayor PC referenced. Um, did you see anything that didn't look accurate, Bill? I mean, you took them, so. Yeah, no, I'd like to make a motion to accept the um, uh, the minutes as written uh, for May twenty eighth, two thousand twenty. Yeah, uh, I'll Louis Mission. I'll second that. Okay. All those uh, in favor? Tim Louis Mitchell, Mission, aye. aye. Bill Mayor, PC, aye. Ben Byrne, aye. Eli, aye. Tim, I, guess, I think we- Tim over, Hilchey, aye. We overlapped there, I guess. Yeah, we did. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, let's see. Oh, we, the only other, we had three, three uh, requests for comments from the zoning the board. <clears throat> Someone on uh, 8 Sherman Drive wants to put a four season addition on. And I looked at the area and there's, we, we, we would have no issues with it. So I would say for that one, we'd have no comment. And that's something, Louis, that Tim Hilchie again, that the other boards are going to make any rulings about whether it's permissible there. Right. Beyond right. our scope. So I would, I would agree with that assessment. Yeah. We just, they just, you know, it's part of the uh, paperwork trail there and whether that we really have any issues if there, we think there's some real uh, wetland issues there. And there's one on, there's another one on 77 Stillwater Road. There's for a house with a in-law apartment. And that's right next to the, uh, where the mushroom place is now. And it's a flat field. So there's another one with no comment that I would say, I don't know if anybody's got questions. I would agree on the no comment on that on where it is. So on Stillwater. And the last one is on one steam mill road to construct a new house on an existing uh, lot, house lot. And that there is a, uh, they have a small cottage there. And I think that, that they, sounds like they want to tear it down and build a larger house. So I have no comment. Anybody got questions or? No, I looked at all three. I didn't have any real comments. No, I agree. I didn't have any any additional feeling on it. Okay. It didn't. Yeah, it didn't seem that increasing the footprint would would uh, come under our jurisdiction. No, I didn't. I didn't see any wetland issues around the area. Or so. So I think uh, have to set the next meeting for the twenty fourth. September. September 24th. September 24th.
And we will have a, maybe another busy one. Hopefully not. <laughs> not this long though. No. I think we got a lot of our work out of the way in this one. A lot this month. Yeah. I, I thought it might go a little quicker, but, and I knew that, you know, we'd have to put it out for review, but. Yeah. Okay. We needed to have some questions and so I think, uh, okay, what time is it? Oh. 9.45. 9.45. I make a motion to adjourn unless there's something else out there. I don't think there is. I'll, I'll second, second that motion. motion. Okay. All in favor? Louis Mission, I. Tim Hilchey, I. Ben Byrne, I. Eli. Bill Mayer, PCI. Well, thank you, gentlemen. It was interesting yeah. me meeting. <laughs> <laughs>